Countless times a day we make transactions online, whether we're emailing a photo, checking a bank account, or pulling up directions on our phones. And millions of times a day, the data from those transactions has to pass through this thing we call the cloud. Essentially, the cloud is just the latest term for a data center. And in order to be able to shop or pay our bills online any time of the day, the data center must be up and running. I'm James Glanz of the New York Times, and I recently toured the data center of a large financial institution with Ken Brill, an expert in the field. This data center is filled with servers that house and process the data that you need to perform all those tasks. And because you want to be able to access that data 24-7, the building is also filled with generators and batteries to keep the data center running in the event of a power break from the outside. Because if there's one rule that must always be observed, it's that the data center must never go down. We're in the data center. The part we're in right now is sort of where the stuff comes in, is broken down and split out, and goes different places. And what are these, these building blocks? I see these, uh, I guess, little computers stacked one after the other after another, hundreds or thousands of them that seem to make up this data center once they're wired together. What, what, what's that all about? What are well, those things? These are, some of them are servers. Most of them are servers in one way or another. We've heard the word servers so for the last that? 20 years. Yeah, what is that? It's like a little computer and it takes data in, processes it according to some program, and spits it back out again. And these servers, um, they don't just run for free, do they? They actually no. take a lot of electricity. Can you give a sense of how much electricity this place is drawing to push all those bits and bytes around as I'm doing my transactions? Well, it's about five megawatts, and that's the energy equivalent of a fairly good sized community. And that's, that's just in this one data center? That's just for this one data center. You multiply it by the, by the universe and it's a lot of energy that's consumption. It's an awful lot of energy. It's so critical to keep these up all the time that we're also standing on a little power plant. It's a backup power plant. The diesel generators, the batteries, those things are standing at the ready just in case the lights go out and there's, and there's another, a blackout, right? But, well, not only that, but because you bring energy in, it's converted to heat, and we've got cooling units all around here to take the heat out. Well, this is the inside of one of the big cooling units that forces cool air down underneath the floor and then up through the hot servers in order to keep them running. Because all the electricity running through those servers generates tremendous amounts of heat, and so you've got to spend more energy to cool them using these units, which are all along the outside of the walls of these big server rooms. In this particular data center, there are servers that work so hard that they need an additional cooling unit. This is what is called a cold aisle containment, and it's a way of dealing with heat densities that we couldn't deal with in the rest of the data center. Why do we need to deal with heat density? Well, because these servers are a lot more intense. They consume more energy because they, they are very high end. And so they, there's always cooling areas around these kind of servers. So just think of this as an ICU for the most intense servers. Well, Ken, most people think of data as some sort of insubstantial thing that comes and goes and doesn't really exist in any specific place. But I guess what we're learning in this place is that data equals hardware. It's, it's a substance almost that you've got to put somewhere once you create it. What we see here relative to the past is so much more intense than anything you would have at home. It would take hundreds of thousands of individual hard drives to equal what we have in this room. And, and why is it that you can't just put all the data that you have on a little flash drive or somewhere out there in a, in a cloud that floats through the air, so to speak? Why is it that it takes this big hardware? Okay, the reason is it's response time. And for some things, you can have it remotely and you don't care about response time. Other times you want to get that instantaneously. So we have something here that has the weight of an SUV to contain millions of gigabytes of data that we might use in financial transactions and, and, and keep. But this isn't the only place they store this data. This is a very energy intensive way of storing information. For those things that we need to archive, we don't want to spend energy spinning disks all the time. So we put it on magnetic tape. So they take it out at every night, night, every night, uh, so that a piece of our financial data is kept kind of for infinity. One of the places it goes is into a former salt mine, 
half a mile or a mile below the surface and it stays there for a period of years. So Ken, there are almost 2,000 big lead acid batteries, much like a truck or a car battery, stacked up inside these cabinets in line after line after line. Why? If the utility fails before the generators start, the batteries have to supply the energy. So in other words, it's, this place is getting constantly being charged, using up power, right. waiting for that moment when the power goes out. Right. Well, we're in the engine generator room, and this is where if the utility fails for an extended period of time, that the, the cloud can continue. Because without electricity, the computers fail. In this room are six generators that would power a small city, like of about 30,000 people. These are diesel generators. Some of the things that we're seeing here, here's the fuel. This is what's called the day tank. So that's all filled with diesel fuel? Just that little tank. Just it's just an emergency tank, or a short term, it's called a day tank. And then backing this up is 20 or 30,000 gallons. Yeah, someone said there are 12,000 maybe gallons of diesel fuel stored in a central place in case all of these to have to go. To support all of these engines. During a blackout or something like yeah. that. So these are, this is 16 pistons inside this pistons. giant generator to run the electrical uh, system in the back here. Right. And above, what do we have above us? Up there we've got the muffler, and if you were to compare the, you know, it's what, 12 feet long in comparison with what you would see on your car. Just to give you an idea, the scale, this is the wire that is used to connect this to other things. And this is roughly uh, a, a dollar a foot, a dollar an inch, so $12 for this piece. I did a fast calculation as there's 32 wires inside the pipes in the back. And so you can easily spend a half million dollars just on wire. And just the idea of the forces involved, you, you, you pointed out that this thing is sitting on sort of shock absorbers. Yeah, right. That's a good point. A concrete pad and then under the concrete pads another layer of absorbent material before you get to the actual concrete. Yeah, just, just because there's so much don't shaking want the vibration force. to get transferred. What would it be like in here if um, blackout happens? Well, we, we have to run we these generators. We What's it like? <laughs> we wouldn't be here without earmuffs. Oh, really? It would be very, very noisy. So this place is roaring like a big factory. Like a big factory. And it's all because uh, those search queries and updating our bank account, orders that we send out over the internet, are going through the servers upstairs, which live on electricity. Is that right? Power that electricity in. goes out, the server no, no, servers, no servers, no internet, no cloud. And these are here to ensure that that electricity is always there.